Ladies and gentlemen, it's another video. This time it's a crow pill video. We're gonna be talking about Frost Giant Studios, a group of individuals who have previously served under Blizzard Entertainment and are now slated to make a triple A real-time strategy game for the first time in a little while, I suppose. Now, if you're just a casual fan of the RTS genre and you got this news that people who made a game that you might have appreciated back in the day are coming together to make another game you hopefully will appreciate now in the current year that we are in, then maybe I can understand why you might be excited by this particular studio, by this particular, uh, the promises that they've been making, the PR statements they've been making, the you know, they've come on the Pylon show, they've done interviews at Team Liquid, they've sort of made the rounds in terms of the endemic press, as far as that is concerned, in a way that is actually unlike the Dreamhaven stuff that I've seen where Mike Morhaime and company have decided to put together a new studio. I haven't really heard that much outside of like Washington Post and stuff like that, where you're not really gonna get the relevant questions to somebody who might actually be interested in the space as a gamer, who might be a little bit more than just a casual viewer of this kind of content, who might be a bit of an enthusiast who actually keeps up with this stuff. I wanna attack mostly the hype that has been building around Frost Giant though, because it does feel a little bit different. I mean, Dreamhaven, I didn't even remember who they were until somebody gave me a link earlier this morning. So it seems very unlikely that that many people are well aware. It's not quite a household name, I think it's fair to say, whereas Frost Giant is, is making a splash in terms of the PR department. But really, this is just marketing, and Blizzard is very good at marketing, so it stands to reason that the individuals from Blizzard would carry on their lessons. But Blizzard is very bad at almost everything else. They're really good at marketing a product that is below the qualitative expectations of most consumers but meets those expectations elsewhere through the marketing department. That is where Blizzard excels. That has essentially been their bread and butter. Despite the fact that they've made numerous PR fiascos and errors and gaffes along the way, the, despite the fact that there's you know the Hong Kong stuff and the, the Chinese money stuff and the Diablo Immortal stuff and the is this an out of season April Fool's joke stuff, despite all of that, we're still dealing with the fact that Apparently, Blizzard is a respected company in the space, and if you at least understand that reality, regardless of whether or not you agree with it, it might help to understand uh, why other people are interested in ex-Blizzard employees moving on. The other component of this, though, that I think is very important to consider when it comes to trying to analyze anything about Frost Giant, anything about Dreamhaven, anything about people who were once of Blizzard fame, is that a lot of individuals still believe that the errors within Blizzard Entertainment games are by and large the fault of Activision. People are still recycling this very old mantra that, oh, Blizzard is still a really good company and they still have a lot of talent and they still have a lot of people who are passionate about games. And the issues come from Activision. So if we take the Blizzard employees and we take them and separate them out from Activision, then maybe there's a chance that we wind up with a, a good product, uh, some game that we can get behind and get hyped for. And that's where what I think uh, is, is the initial starting point for a lot of fans. A lot of people who are just interested in, you know, in a very casual way. They, they were fans of Warcraft 3, which is impossible for me to understand, but they were fans of that game. They were fans of Starcraft 2. They were fans of Diablo 3. They were fans of all of these really, really low effort games. And at the end of the day, they look at those games and they say, well, I, you know, the games kind of went downhill after a while. Obviously, Reforged was a disaster and the StarCraft II expansions were messy and nobody likes Diablo 3 anymore now. So it must have been a situation where, you know, the, the games were ran into the ground by management or something. You know, like that that's their, their what they latch on to, generally speaking. That's what it seems like from a, an outsider looking in, from somebody who's not at all bought into the hype of a Blizzard game since probably Warcraft 3 initially because that was the game where uh, you know Warcraft 2 was okay, and obviously StarCraft was my favorite game, so hey, they're coming out with another one. Interesting. And I, I, I had missed the boat on Diablo 2, so like that was pretty, pretty much the last time I was hyped out of anything that Blizzard came out with in their catalog. I never got into World of Warcraft. I never got into any other games after that. I suppose StarCraft 2 might have been the game where I thought that there might have been some potential, but ultimately, I, I had pretty uh, strong opinions about that game from the get-go. You know, the idea that uh, it was going to be 3D and, and all of this other shit. So ultimately, we look at the games as they are, 
they are bad before Activision comes into the play. It comes into the field. And when, when Activision comes to play, when Activision knocks on the door, and when there is that merger, a lot of people assume that that was the catalyst for the drop in quality. But I think you should take another look at some of the games that you think exude polish and exude quality and, and have that, that blizzard sheen of polish associated with them. You know, I say this stuff and I can't help myself from laughing because the people who watch this video who are already familiar with my content, they're probably already in agreement that none of these words mean anything. Just like the AAA moniker doesn't mean anything anymore. It's a meaningless term because pretty much every game could have AAA quality assets or, you know, com you know composition or something like that. And ultimately the top end of gaming is really that, not that far from the amateurish level of indie games. So at this point, you can't really look to any particular game and say that the AAA moniker means anything now because so many AAA games have been outright horrible that how can you differentiate between that and an indie game? Is it just the marketing? Because that's pretty much all I see. So circling back now to <clears throat> the Frost Giant Studios themselves, these guys are in essence, you know, ex Blizzard employees, and they're riding the the little bit of hype that they can get from being ex Blizzard employees, which might actually be sufficient enough to catapult them into positions of you know relevance within the industry itself, right? Because if you consider the fact that they are essentially using their connections and their their sort of uh, resume, and they're using that to get on all of these different uh, shows and, and get these interviews, and w wisely enough, they are sticking mostly to endemic gaming press so that there is a sense that these people are actually interested in, you know, real talking points about their, their content. W what's not to get excited about then? I've, I've tried to spell out the fact that their connection to Blizzard is not really that important and doesn't really give you that much confidence in their abilities because it's not like Blizzard produced good games while these people were under their banner. They produced games that sold well, yes, but if your metric for whether or not a game is good is sales figures, then you uh, props to you for making it this far into the video, man, but this is not for you. This is a discussion over your head. So if we're going to be talking about a situation where you know, we're trying to take a nuanced opinion, we're trying to understand how people could be potentially hyped or what, what, what should be exciting about this move. I mean, the, the one exciting thing that you can get behind, no matter what your opinion of Blizzard's quality is, is if you just look at the fact that it's another RTS game, and in theory, there's people who are experienced in the space and have done RTS games before, and in theory, there's more potential out of this studio to get a high-quality RTS game than most RTS developments that are currently going on. Like, you think of the Immortal devs, uh, who's the actual studio, I don't actually recall off the top of my head, but those people are essentially just StarCraft II mappers uh, that, and game state modifiers. You can't call them modders because there is no modding in that game, but if, you know, the closest allegory would be a modder. Like, it, it would be if somebody like me decided to start a studio and, you know, because I have a lot of history with Brood War modding, that would be like, oh, wow, he's, you know, been in the game for so long. Like, what can you really say at that point, right? There's no, there's no immediate connection between that and then why you should assume something would be of high quality if you just look at what I was doing before. But these guys are in the industry, so they, in theory, have enough expertise and experience and, you know, a bit of a background in the space that such that they'll at least, in theory, overlook and, uh, you know, ignore some of the, the pitfalls that are easy to, to fall into. And, uh, you know, it, it, like I said earlier, props to them for carrying over the marketing strategies and being wise about the way that they approach the whole space. But ultimately, they don't really inspire a lot of confidence with what they say. And what they say, honestly, doesn't even really matter at the end of the day. Like, you can go and look at these interviews and listen to these uh, talk shows and stuff like that, right? The Pylon Show and stuff like that. You can go and, and listen to all of these areas and, and really d try to mine every single bit of information for whatever value you can get. And there's a couple of bits and pieces in there, like... You know, the, the laughable notion that StarCraft II had better pathfinding than Brood War, for example, whereas if you understand how StarCraft II's pathfinding works and the fact that there's auto clumping and the fact that it takes away decisions from the player, it automates decisions away from the player, it's obviously not going to be superior pathfinding. And, you know, very few people have even identified what the actual problems with Brood Wars Pathfinding are. They just call it dumb or old school pathfinding or something. If they're trying to be nicer, they call it old school. They, they just call it bad and, and they, they fail to actually you know, qualitatively break it down and figure out what's wrong with it. Whereas if you ask somebody like me, I could easily tell you, 
It's because, you know, when, when it comes to the pathfinding segments themselves, units don't wait in line. They assume that a unit that's blocking them is not never going to move. And so they start spinning out and that's what you get with Dragoons. And that problem is exacerbated by the fact that the animations are moving at different speeds. So the unit itself is moving different numbers of matrices in the middle or numbers of pixels in the middle of its animation. You know, you could I could go into technical details about that. And I, I'm sure there would be a way to sum it up in a way that most people would be able to understand, even if they didn't know anything about the technical details, whereas obviously that was a more technical and less uh, everyman, sort of less layman friendly approach to breaking the issue down. I could probably find a way to write that down. And somebody else who knows the same amount or more information than I do could probably figure out a way to break that down. But I've never heard of that or seen that in any interview and in any any sort of breakdown of this stuff. And the only thing that I can think of is that either they're, you know, that most likely, you know, Occam's razor, they just don't understand it. But if they do understand it and they they don't discern, you know, that this is inf important information and that this is something that the public should know and that this is going to inform their design decision, then I, I guess they're just being sort of a, that, that malicious incompetence that comes in where, you know, the, when you're so bad at your job that you actually lower the quality of everybody else's experience. So that, that's essentially what I would come in. But, the, you know, you get notions like that, talking points like that, where you're opting into some sort of uh, areas where you can you can choose to make the game more micromanagement heavy, which is like autocast and stuff in Warcraft 3. You can you can choose to opt into certain elements of complexity and, and that way it's more casual friendly. And, and I've seen a lot of information from these individuals at the studio where they say that they're going to try to make the game, the genre in general, more accessible than it has been before. But RTS games can't work as accessible games. They aren't RTS games at that point. The more accessibility options you add and the more you make the game more reasonable for casual players, you're essentially taking away the real-time aspect of the real-time strategy. And that's two-thirds out of the moniker. So I don't really know what you're expecting to end up with. If, if we look to Warcraft 3, where everything was based on cooldowns and heroes and small-scale stuff... I mean, that game was way closer to a turn-based game than a real-time strategy game just because of how slow things actually were. You had plenty of time to react, and only at the very high level did snap decisions actually matter. Whereas if you co contrast that with StarCraft 1, moved way faster than Warcraft 3. StarCraft 2 moves a little too fast, particularly considering the fact that there is that auto-clumping that takes away your decision-making, you, your units clump up together, and you just get destroyed by AoE abilities that are point-and-click and thus have no real counterplay to them beyond reacting once they deploy. So... Ultimately, you know, the, the more deeper you go into the sort of Blizzard uh, catalog and figure out, like, well, what went wrong here? And, and why are these games not playing as well as Brood War, a game that was made in 1997 and released in 98? And, like, what, what exactly happened here? So at that point, you know, the, the more you, you deeper you look, the, the, the less pretty a picture is painted by people who still are not identifying these core issues with the, the games that came afterwards. Now, again, I don't know if... You know, this is a cynical approach to the marketing. I don't know if Frost Giant Studios are coming into these talk shows or coming into these interviews and they're saying things that they think fans want to hear about Warcraft 3 and Starcraft 2, but secretly are working to develop a really good RTS game that is not going to bother with stupid accessibility features or make it so that you can opt into complexity with autocast or whatever the fuck else people are going to come up with to try to make the game or the genre in general more accessible and more casual as a result. Maybe that's the case. I would hazard a guess that, again, Occam's Razor, it's probably not likely. Like, that's probably not what they're doing. They probably are going to make a very, very casual game, like Warcraft 3, like StarCraft 2. They're probably going to make an RTS game that is not even a shadow of what Brood War is. Not even a shadow of what some of the lesser RTS games, like the Command & Conquer series, like even like Red Alert 2, for example, which had a select all army button just like StarCraft 2 and yet ends up being a better RTS game than that game. Like, you're probably not even going to hold a candle to fucking Armies of Exigo, which is a really old RTS game that came out and tried to basically be a better version of StarCraft, but because of the difference in uh, setting, because it was a fantasy game and not a sci-fi game, most people assumed it was trying to ape Warcraft 3, which was really confusing and just shows you how little people really understand stuff, I think. And that was a game that obviously didn't succeed at being better than StarCraft 1, but it, it at least did try to improve aspects of the game and prov provided you with a, a serious option. You know, they, they were rushed out the door by Ubisoft, so you can't say that they were given a real fair crack at it, but the developers of that particular game clearly were trying in ways that I have not seen Blizzard try in a very long time. So, summing up my thoughts here in this relatively meandering crow pill video, we're going to be trying to make you take that crow pill and make you check your hype when it comes to Frost Giant Studios. We're really just trying here to 
pierce the shroud, pierce the, the scree that I'm he seeing and hearing online, where people are getting super hyped for a game that is being developed by people who were previously working at a game development studio that didn't develop quality products and has not developed quality products in a long time. And when they did develop quality products like Brood War, it was a fucking fluke. It was a complete accident. And it was only by virtue of them being too lazy to fix issues and continue to balance the game that the game had its legacy that it currently has right now. And, you know, if Blizzard decided to start updating the game and balancing it like they have with Warcraft 3, I think it would become way worse at the end of the day. You know, these these games generally do not get better with more attention from these developers, unfortunately. I wish it were the case that Blizzard was able to fix issues, but they have shown a very poor track record, and only finally are they stopping tweaking with StarCraft II. So again, this is the, the sort of pedigree that these developers are trucking with. And this is the pedigree that they have. This is their ancestry. This is their lineage. You can look back at this and say, oh yeah, we've got a huge amount of you know experience in the industry, but it's experience under a banner of a game development studio that has not produced a quality product in years and never really produced a quality product deliberately. Then setting that aside, okay, that's where they come from. But at least, again, they have that experience and they're using the marketing experience, which Blizzard has always excelled with, to great effect here to sort of get themselves in the public domain, in, in the mind of the individual, right? They're increasing their mind share, to use really unfortunate terms. So, you know, looking past that, what else are they offering? Well, what they're actually saying is stuff like making the game more accessible, right? So you, you've, you've looked at what they've done in the past and you're looking at what they're saying they're going to do. And it's not painting a very rosy picture. Again, you're looking at somebody who's, you know, these people have come from a, a, a game development studio that has run the genre into the ground. And now they're going to go into another crack at the genre separate from that game development studio, but bringing with them the marketing techniques and also the rhetoric, the design rhetoric of a game developer that prizes, you know, sales over actual product quality, which sounds like every developer right now, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't aspire to something greater. So I know for fans of the series or fans of Blizzard or whatever, this video is going to seem really strange. And ultimately it is going to seem like it was only made for a group of people who already had arrived at similar conclusions. So I'm sure I'll get accused of poisoning the well to some extent. But all I encourage you to do at the end of the day is to not worry about whether or not you should pre-order this game that is coming out or get really hyped for them or whatever at least make sure that you wait for them to demonstrate something of quality before you try to financially back them or before you try to get hyped and spread the word and increase their mind share for them. Ultimately, they have not done anything to deserve that. Just because they come from a, a big name game developer doesn't mean that they're going to make a good game. And just because they talk a big shop about you know, making the genre more accessible doesn't even mean they'll succeed at doing that. We don't know anything yet. Again, we don't know. Maybe they'll release the best RTS game ever made. But until they actually do something, let's, let's pipe down on the hype train and uh, just wait a sec. Wait until there's an actual delivery. That's it for me. I'll see you guys next time.